God's house today as we close the book of Exodus. We're looking at the book of Exodus, and this is the very last instance of, of, our, uh, of our study through the book of Exodus. It's a long book. It's a, such an important book. It's such a, such a great episode in the life of, of the church and the life of God's people that we've really dug in and spent a lot of time, and we're going to look at the very last thing that, that is said in the book of Exodus about, uh, about our trip, about our, our journey as God's people. I was looking back through my notes, and we began this, uh, we began this quite a while ago. It was actually in, uh, in uh, been more than a year. been more than a year. So back in 20 of... Uh, in August of 20, I remember as, as school started in, in August of 20, that's when we first started looking into the book of Exodus. And we've been just piece by piece traveling through with God's people, seeing how God is shaping His people into, uh, into a people. As we, as we study through the, through the people of God and the nation of Israel, we realize something very different about the way that God built a people compared to the way that other nations begin. When you hear about a dynasty beginning or a nation beginning or a country beginning and throughout history, they always begin with, this is a conquering king and he defeated all of his enemies and set up his, his kingdom. And when we read about God's people their story begins, God's people were slaves in Egypt land. God called a man and he said, you're going to be a great man, you'll be a father of many nations, that's Abraham. You're going to have so many children, you won't be able to count them. It'll be like trying to count stars or trying to count sand. There's going to be that many all over the place. And yet, when that story of Abraham closes, he just had one son that counted as a, as a child of promise. And the only land that he owned was the was the ground, the cave where he buried his wife. So it didn't. It seemed like everything was kind of on pause. And as the children of his children, his family descendants, went down into Egypt, there was only seventy of them. But now, in slavery, God has made a people, and He's made a great nation in slavery. And so the first thing He did is He redeemed them. The first step in making his people is that God redeemed his people. And that's the way he does with us. That's our story too, as God's people. As a child of God, as a, as a member of God's church, the first step is when he redeems you. And when he creates the church, his first step is to redeem the church. And so, we're looking at it now at the end of the book of Exodus. And we see uh, all these great stories and plagues and, and burning bushes and everything that has gone on with the water from the rock and the Mount Sinai and the Ten Commandments. Everything now that is had pointed to the construction of the tabernacle. As we looked at all those, the reasons that the tabernacle was so detailed that he spent chapter after chapter giving instructions on how to build this tabernacle and how to achieve the worship of God, it's because every step in the tabernacle worship was going to point to Jesus and what Jesus is doing for his people and how Jesus redeemed us. Every little detail was looking forward to the ministry of Christ, looking forward to how God uh, set up shop with Jesus and sets up the church. So here we are. Uh, we'll turn with me to the book of Exodus, the 40th chapter. Actually, I want to look one verse ahead of that. Look at the end of the 39th chapter. The scene is set. So let's look at 39, this is verse 43. 39, 43, the scene is set. They've got everything built for worship. And it's been a couple of chapters telling us how they got this guy to build this part of this furniture. They got these guys to build this part of the furniture. And he tells them which side of the tabernacle these guys all have to, uh, this tribe is on this side, this tribe is on that side, and the door is always facing this way. And it gives us all these directions and all these instructions. And then Moses comes by to inspect. And all the chapter, all the preparations have been made. And so 
Moses inspected all the work that they had accomplished, that they had done, just as the Lord had commanded them. And then Moses blessed them. So then I kind of have in my mind a, a, a mental image of, of Adam at this point, where Adam is in the garden and all the animals come up and he, he gives the animals a name. And, he, and so he's, he is in the garden and he's doing his work as God commanded him. And then God blessed him. That be fruitful and multiply it gives him a blessing as well. So this is kind of a kind of a new creation, a new beginning is going fixing to happen. So we get this anticipation. Wow, God is really going to do something cool here. God is really about to start something new with His people. He's got all His people together, and they've got all the instructions. They're following all the instructions. They've set up their tabernacle, and so now we see that God is blessing them. So after this, Moses starts to take everything and put it in its place. He says, you're going to set the tabernacle up. So he puts the tabernacle up. He put the screen up. He put the, so they've got all the things. The furniture is all there. So he's, he's organizing the furniture, arranging the furniture. Took the ark and put it where it belongs. He took the, the, the lampstand and put it where he belongs. And he did all this, it says, in the first month of the second year. So... We have been studying this book for just a little over a year. And sure enough, when we get here, this is the one year anniversary of them leaving the, they left Egypt in the first month. And a whole year later, it took them about three months to get down to Sinai. And then they, then they had to spend a couple of times, a couple of months waiting on Moses to go get the, the, the tablets, right? Uh, he's up there for 40 days. And comes down and then they have that terrible scene with the golden calf breaks those tablets and he has to go back up and it's another 40 days getting them again and so uh, the months pass so then they start the construction building everything and so now here we are one year later one year after they left the, the land of Egypt they're out of slavery God has redeemed them out of slavery and now they've got everything set up for worship. It's been one whole year. And then the story goes in down in verse 34. The cloud covered the tent of the And the glory of the Lord filled with the tabernacle. Moses was unable to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud rested on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. The Israelites set out wherever the cloud was, whenever the cloud was taken up, the tabernacle, they from the tabernacle, all the stages of their journey. If the cloud was not taken up, they did not set out until the day it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle day and night. And there was a fire inside the cloud by night, visible to the entire house of Israel throughout all the stages of their journey. So, when they get everything set up, when they get all of the furniture in place, when they're doing all the things as God commanded, then the glory of the Lord came down and it rested right there on the tabernacle. And it was so overwhelming. The glory of the Lord was so overwhelming, it says that everybody could see it. Moses couldn't even enter the tent because of the glory of the Lord was just so overwhelming. So what does this glory of the Lord mean? That's our, our big question here. What does God's glory mean? It says that the glory was there. This is something visible. This was something tangible, maybe not tangible, but it was certainly able to feel it in, a, in a spiritual sense because they knew that it was there. Absolutely. Well, the glory marks God's presence. When the glory came down into that tabernacle, everyone knew right away that God was there. It was not a question, is God going to show up today? Is God here at all? Is God even with us anymore? Sometimes they would ask that. Sometimes we ask that. You know, where is God in the, in the midst of all the things that are going on? We wonder, is God here? Well, God has promised to be here. See, the, the glory that they experienced marked that God was present. These are visible manifestations. 
So this is the same glory. It's described as cloud and fire, right? So we look at the places where God's presence was there, and we see cloud and fire always showing up. This is the same fire that Jesus, or that God came down into that burning bush. When Moses saw the bush that was burning and yet not being burnt, that was the glory of God resting right there. So that is the same glory. And then when the people of, of Israel saw the cloud come down onto the top of Mount Sinai, when Moses went up to get the Ten Commandments, it was, the whole top of the mountain was covered with a cloud. That's the same cloud. That's the glory of God. The presence of God is right there with them. Now, many years later, 400 years later, they decided the tent was through. We're going to have a permanent house. And that's the guy named Solomon built that. They built the, the temple it was called Solomon's Temple. It was God's temple that was constructed in Solomon's reign. And they dedicated the temple. And when they had that temple dedication, this same thing happened. The glory of God came down and filled the temple. And sure enough, the priests that were giving the, the uh, blessings, the re priests that were reading the, the scriptures, they couldn't even speak. Everybody was just so overwhelmed with the presence of God at that point. That was the glory that inhabited that temple right there. Now later on, we see the same thing happening when Jesus is born. Those shepherds that we just sang about, when they were out there keeping watch over their, their flock by night, the angel of the Lord came about them, and all of a sudden, what happened? The glory of God shone round about this. So they're in the middle of the night, they're out there with their sheep, coffee in the thermoses, and, and uh, telling jokes around the fire, and they hear them. They decide they better not count those sheep because then they'll fall asleep. So they just, they're just talking to each other. And all of a sudden, here's an angel. Say, the Messiah that your country's been waiting for for a thousand years and more, he's here. He's born tonight. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. All of a sudden, it's like daytime. In the middle of the night. Well, that's the glory of God. Shining right there. We see it also travel over to the book of Acts where the Spirit of God comes down to inhabit the church and to rest into the church. Now, this is God's next home. It's His church. And the Spirit of God comes down and then it looks like fire. Everybody's like, wow, there's fire everywhere. But it's not the kind of fire that burns people up. It's the kind of fire that's in that burning bush. It's the kind of presence of God that shines on the on the camp on the camp where they're keeping the sheep. It's the glory of God that is visible and marks God's presence with his people. See, we don't have a God that says, all right, I'm going to save you and I'm going to redeem you. So you're a child of God now. Okay, you're a Christian now. You're on your own. Call me if you get into trouble and I'll decide whether or not I can help. That's not the kind of God, God that we have. The God, well, if you're too busy, maybe you can, uh, if you're not too busy, maybe you can answer this prayer. That's not the kind of God that we have. We have a God who says, I'm going to be with you. And then he promises he's going to be with us, and then he fulfills that promise. He says he's going to be with us, and he is. He didn't just like create the world and set it spinning like a top, fold his arms and say, Let's see how long this goes. And if they get into trouble, well, we'll just watch and see what happens. We don't have a God that's just watching the universe spin and run out of energy. We have a God who's in the world and active in the world. And when we pray to Him, we know that He's doing something. Let me show you how it answers this prayer. God's glory marks His presence. And God's glory marks the fulfillment of God's promise. I'm flipping back to Exodus 29 here. Exodus 29, at the end of this chapter, God says, I will consecrate my tent of meeting. 
I said, I'm going to be there. I'm going to consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, and I'm going to consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the Israelites. I'm going to live there. I am going to dwell with my people. God wants to live with us. God wants to dwell with us. God wants to walk with us and fellowship with us. That's why He does all of this. He wants to be present in our lives. I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God that brought them out of the land of Egypt so that I might dwell among them and I am the Lord their God. So this marks the, the fulfillment of God's promise that he was there. The glory marks his presence and the glory marks his promise. And the glory of God is why we are all here. That's why we're here in the first place. For this one, I'm going to have to go over to Isaiah. Let me zip over to Isaiah and just read you this passage here. Because this one... This one is such a cool, cool little verse because God tells us why He does something. God doesn't have to tell us why. Most of the time, He doesn't tell us why. You know, our brains probably couldn't hold it. But sometimes God tips His hand and shows you what He's going to do. Shows you why He's doing what He does. So here's the motive that God has. This is Isaiah 43, 7. Everyone that is called by my name is created for my glory. We are created for God's glory. I have formed them and I have made them. Do you realize that there is a purpose for your life? It's not just a bunch of cells getting together and uh, creating a person that has no purpose. There's no reason for you to be here. There is an absolute reason for you to be here. You specifically were created for God's glory. God wants to be glorified through your life and through my life and through the lives of all of His people. God has built you for His glory. That's why He made you. So, you think, well, there's no reason for me to exist. There absolutely is a reason for you to exist. You exist to bring God glory. How are we going to do that? How is it that we can achieve that purpose. How can we live up to our design specifications? How is it that we're supposed to glorify God? Well, the way that the way that we see that they did that here in the book of Exodus is through worship. Right? That tabernacle that held God's glory was a place of worship. This is what they were doing in that tabernacle. We glorify God as we worship. See, worship is what sustains the people of God. That's the glue that holds God's people together, is worship. Whenever the worship of God started breaking down, then the people started like, falling apart. That's that glue. We've got to have that connection to God and that connection to, to each other. God wants to, glory, to dwell with His people, but He wants to dwell with people together. In addition to just your relationship with God, you have a relationship with other people in the church. Together, we glorify God. That great psalm that says, says uh, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continue to be of my mouth. Come, let us exalt His name together. It goes from me and God to us and God. Just like that. We, hooked together, glorify God, and the worship of God is what binds us together. We can see this all the way through the, the Old Testament. They started falling away into idolatry, and then, sure enough, they start scattering and and it would take a revival for everybody to get back together. Let's worship the Lord together. Let's do this thing right. Right toward the end of the, of the history of God's people there the, in these books of Kings and Chronicles, right toward the end, everyone was just falling away and 
They were setting up little high places and shrines all over the place. They, did, they weren't going to the central place to worship anymore. And then the king found the word of God. They found the word of God. They brought it to the king. And when the king read the word of God, he realized how far away from God's word they had fallen. And he tore his clothes. And he said, guys, we've got to get back to what the Bible says. We've got to get back to what God's word indicates for us, which is to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. And they got back together and said they had the best worship service in their history. The worship of God is what binds the people of God together. It is ultimately important. That is why we're here. We give God glory through our worship. It has to be our priority. We have to demonstrate that God is important in our lives by worship. That is, that is just a non-negotiable. And we glorify God by our worship. We also glorify God by obedience. We can't say, God, I love you, but uh, I'm not really keen on this task you've set for me. Yeah? So, see how long you will last at your job by saying, all right, boss, I'll do whatever you say, except uh, all that stuff on the list, I'm not doing that. Yeah, I know it's in my job description, but no thanks. I don't really like doing that stuff. How long are you going to last at that job? Not very long. In other words, you're telling the boss, you're not my boss. Right? So if we say, Jesus, you are my king. You are my Lord. But I'm not going to do what you say. Then we're following the line of that, that disciple Peter who said, No, Lord. <laughs> you can't say no and Lord. If he's Lord, then the answer is yes. Right? No and Lord don't go together. So we glorify God with obeying God. You can read through this chapter and see how many times it says they did just as the Lord commanded them. Just as the Lord commanded them. Let me just, here's a quick view here. Here's one in 32. There's one in 30. There is one in 25, uh, and so on. Well, there's one in 21. 20 times, 20 times in the last couple of chapters here, that little phrase happens. They did this just as God commanded them. They did it this way because that's how God commanded them. Over and over again, we have that little phrase. They did just as God commanded them. That's why it's so important for, for one whole group of chapters to say, this is what you're supposed to do. And another whole chapter to say, chapters to say, this is exactly what they did because that's what God commanded them. So all of those descriptions of the furniture and, the, and how they were to construct the tabernacle, it's in there twice. One to say they got the instructions and the next time to say they did the instructions just like they were told. They followed the instructions. We glorify God as we obey Him. As we follow His leading as we are directed to it. And we glorify God by the works that we do, the things that we do. This is a section from the Sermon on the Mount here, where God says, you're the salt of the earth. Salt can't lose its saltiness, or it's not going to be any use. You're the light of the world. People don't put a light and hide it under a bushel, hide it under a basket. And in the same way, you're supposed to glorify God through your good works. Let people see, let your light so shine that people can see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Okay? Not to see your good works and glorify yourself, so everybody can say what a good Christian you are, but people should see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We glorify God with our good works, with our obedience, and with our worship. When our light shines this way, then we're able to, to glorify God in all of these wonderful things, all these different ways. And so, this is the way that the book closes out. Here watch the movie that, that uh, 
when you watch this movie, you think it's coming to a nice conclusion. They're, they're rounding things off on both ends, and all the bad guys have been caught, and all the good guys are, are cheering. And, and you watch these shows like that, and it's got this great resolution. But then, right there toward the end, you realize that, that they've left some things unsaid. They've left some things kind of wide open. Instead of closing off nice and fine, you think, well, this is just really left, left open-ended here. Yes, the bad guys got caught, and the good guys are, are all hooked together, and they got a team now. And, and uh, it, makes, it makes you wonder, well, what are they going to do next? And you think, oh, those studios. They have set me up for a sequel, right? So they just left it open for them to make a whole other movie with these guys, right? Or there, there are going to be a lot more episodes on this. That's the same kind of feeling I get when I was reading the, bit, the end of the book of Exodus. Here they are. The people of God have been redeemed. That's always the first step. The people of God are now redeemed. Then the people of God are gathered together in worship. They're finally worshiping together. No more of this golden calf nonsense. No more of this wondering what God is going to do. No more challenging than to who's going to give us the, the instructions here. Moses is the man. And he's given us the law of God. So now they're all kind of unified toward the worship of God. And they're all moving together in the right direction. So it just kind of makes me think, all right, this is... This here is setting up for the next adventure. So we got Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy as, their, as the further adventures of the Israelites. So it's, it's kind of looking forward and, and setting us up with this anticipation here. And that anticipation is built when I read this stuff. Whenever the cloud gets taken up, then they pack up. Whenever the cloud starts moving, they pick up their furniture and start moving. Everybody knows what job they've got. Uh, tribe of Dan, my name is Dan, so I kind of identify with the tribe of Dan. Uh, tribe of Dan, you get to take this curtain. So the tribe of Dan goes and rolls up their curtain and they start packing it away. This tribe gets to carry the altar, right? So they gather around the altar. Whenever the cloud moves, they move. Whenever the cloud stops, they stop. How long are we going to be here? Don't know. However long it takes. When the cloud stops, we unroll the tent, we start, we have regular worship. And if God wants to move, they move. If God wants to stay, they stay. So here they are, finally, God's people redeemed, worshiping, and moving in the, in the same direction, ready to go on toward that promised land. That's that same kind of anticipation that we need to have. Whenever you put your trust in God, whenever you say, Jesus, I want you to come in my life and be my Savior and my Lord and my boss, whenever you tell Jesus, I'm ready to move when you move, to stop when you stop, and to get busy and worship whenever we're stopped, whenever you give that, that green light to God, that's going to build up this kind of anticipation in you. Right, God, what are you going to do next? What have you got in store? Well, we've had some prayer requests come through in our church just this, just the last couple of days. So yes, they're serious. They're, these are these are things that we that come to us and we think, wow, oh no, what's going to what's going to happen? I've got that anticipation. God, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do? How are you going to figure this out? God, I just can't wait to see what are you going to do next. And I look around at the, I look around at our world. And some, sometimes it makes us kind of get pessimistic, thinking of all the problems that are coming down, and, and uh, the, the, the wars and the rumors of the wars, and the, and the storms, the terrible storms that, that are wiping out um, and causing so much trouble around our country. And, and yet we can also see relief efforts, see how God's people are getting together and moving and helping. We see the good works that are glorifying God. It, it just makes me anticipate, what are you going to do next? And we have Christmas is right around the corner. And we, we think, Jesus, 
what we may all be hoping for Christmas. When you see the shape of our world, God could come any instant, and we might all be in our ultimate home before the 25th. You never know. It just gives us that anticipation. God's going to do something great. God's going to move. Put your life in God's hands. And then see what He's going to do next. Let's pray together. Jesus, we, we're so anxious to see how, you, how you're going to move in these days ahead and, these, and the lives and the prayer requests that, we, that are, are coming to us. So when we bow for prayer, we're just overwhelmed with the amount of need in the world, but we're also overwhelmed by your glory and the, the power and the intensity of your glory that can just overshadow us and fill the world and charge us with this electric anticipation of what you are going to do and are doing in our world. Help us to, to see things from your perspective, to be able to look at the world through your eyes, and to see all the people that need you in this hour and this day that are all around us. And help us to be that light and that word that they need to hear. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.